Hey guys, Pablo with BND and today at Top Reddit Post we're gonna be taking a look at malicious compliance. Before we start, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, the notifications bell sign and give us a like and leave a comment in the end of this video. 3 plus 3 plus 1.5, all you're getting is a half an hour tops. Years ago, one of my employer clients decided to set up a new office in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I got chosen to spend three weeks there getting the new space set up. Also chosen for a job was a guy from another division's Chicago office, Dave. I'd never worked with Dave before, but from the start, I didn't like him much. He was never less than 15 minutes late, he lumbered like a zombie, and I caught him dozing off more than a few times during the first week on site. Still, he was the closest thing I had to a friend in Fort Wayne, so I invited him out to the bar on Friday for all the company funded booze we could drink. I wish, he says, I'm going home and passing out until Monday. Commute has been killing me. Wait, what? It seems Dave's boss had been a dick and instead of paying for a plane ticket, hotel and rental car like my boss had, he'd instructed Dave to drive. From Chicago, almost three hours away. Dude, that's like totally no bueno. Six hours a day just driving? Yeah, it sucks. Still, it'll be killer money. That puts you in like, what, 70 hours this week? Jeez, make sure you put in for gas and tolls quick though. The last time I had to get reimbursed for expenses, it took them over a month. I could see what little light Dave's eyes held fade. They're not going to pay for any of that. Hearing that, I put in a call to my boss, who was as puzzled as I was. If he'd worked for our division, he'd be paid for his drive time and expenses at least. And we're both pretty sure it was a corporate addict and not something individual divisions could choose not to obey. Unfortunately, neither I nor my boss had any say in the matter and neither of us were familiar with Illinois or Indiana labor's law. So all we could do was to advise Dave to save his receipts for the IRS and complain to HR. On Monday, Dave was late again. After an hour, I was worried and called his cell phone. I just passed Portage. Make pretty good time, all things considered. I should be there in about two hours. Dave sounded perfectly happy about it, so I figured he'd been required to stop at his office before heading out for some reason. Okay Dave, I'll see you then. When Dave arrived a little after 11, the first thing he did was take a 15 minute break. Long drive, I understood. There was still most of the day ahead of us, and after the break, Dave finally got down to business, booting up his computer. He had barely logged in when he stood up and announced that he was taking his lunch. Okay. Something was going on, but I hadn't the foggiest idea what. After lunch, Dave finally got around to some work, putting in a good 20 minutes reading email before stopping by to see me. I'm going to take my sack 15 now, then I'm heading home. Uh, what? Dave was grinning like a nut. Don't worry, I spoke to HR over the weekend. I didn't see Dave on Tuesday, his cell phone was going unanswered, and neither my boss or I had any luck finding out why. We didn't try hard. Not our zoo and not our monkey after all. Ditto for Wednesday, but whatever, he's probably just sick. And then on Thursday I see Dave before work at the hotel breakfast buffet. Dave, I was getting worried when you were on no show the last two days. Dave laughed a little and after we'd piled our plates with bad scrambled eggs and a burnt sausage, told me a story. On Monday, the client had noticed him coming in late, doing no work and leaving early and called our company to complain. Dave in turn was called into disciplinary meeting with his boss and local HR were prepared to terminate him over putting in for 32 hours of unearned overtime this previous week and not working at all the day before. They've said they're serious too. One of the guys from Building Security interrupted the meeting to deliver a box containing the personal effects from his desk. They've had an ace though, well, three aces. An email from his boss instructing him to drive to Fort Wayne every day at his own expense as a change in work location. An email from corporate HR telling him that while he wasn't required to work overtime, he was required to report any overtime worked, including driving to or from a client, and a page from his division employee manual which covered paid breaks offsite. When he informed them that he was not working anymore overtime, and after three hours driving in, one and a half hours of breaks, and three hours home, it left him with just a half an hour a day to do actual work. Less actually if the traffic was bad. Oh, and the corporate HR was willing 
going to stand behind him on it. He just spoke into them before the meeting. It took them about three seconds to realize they were screwed. And well, here I am back in action. Since everything was booked last minute, I'm in a suit with a jacuzzi and my rent is a damned Cadillac. Hey man, you know, sometimes following the rules and reading your employee's manual, it may save your job and actually gonna screw with your boss too. Sure, I'll shut down all but one cooling system for the computer server to save you money. I didn't have any hand in this. In fact, I was caught in the fallout of this malicious compliance alongside with every student in every art program in the college. Fallout was drastic, to say the least. I'm taking a visual design program at a community college. It's the middle of exam month, and we're working to finish a semester-long project that doubles as our final exam. Naturally, everyone Everyone's working overtime to get things finished. I was in the computer lab working near the back. The place I'm working on is also near one of the server banks. I'm wrapping up my work and getting ready to submit when suddenly the file transfer stops and it says I've lost connection to the server. No big deal. I figured that it's probably the fact that the servers are overloaded. Up until other people in the lab are asking if anyone lost connection to the server. That's when I noticed the distinct smell of something akin of melting plastic. A few minutes of investigation and the cause is found. Turns out that all the server banks were cooked completely. Everyone in the lab agrees to email the person who handles those servers, who just so happens to be our teacher. He shows up a half hour later with a wide grin on his face. Teacher is absolutely giddy. He announced after sitting against the table at the front of the room for 10 minutes. Sorry everyone, but it looks like the servers are going to be down for the remainder of the semester. Be sure to send a thank you letter to the dean of the college. Teacher later went on to explain that the dean ordered him to shut down down the cooling system of the servers and switch to one centralized system, but he protested it and tried to explain that the system would fail, which would subsequently cause all the banks to overheat. However, the dean simply told him to do it or else she'd fire him then hire someone who would. Teachers known to fight any decisions made that involve handling the max and everything related to them, primarily because he set up the system himself and everyone that's being hired to help him handle it messes it up some form or another. So he decided to execute some malicious compliance. We haven't been told if the backup servers were affected nor how much it will cost the college, but the server holds all the data for every art program in the college. So a lot of people have been affected. Moreover, with the service effectively down, we can't submit our final exam. We've been told that we have to print our projects out and that the expenses will be covered by the college. Edit. So I would like to point out some fundamental things. I am not tech savvy, please keep it in mind. The computer lab I was in has a room in the back that is keypad locked. That is where the server room is for the labs in the building. I thought people would understand this, so I didn't point it out. But apparently, I have to. I didn't see the server room for myself. Someone came in after a few minutes and said they checked the server banks or whatever they're supposed to be called. Apparently, I'm stupid for calling them server banks and said that they were cooked. I assumed they were being literal given that I smelled what I thought was burning plastic. Keep in mind that I am not tech savvy at all. My technological know-how is not as extensive as people think. It pretty much goes without saying that everyone in the comments knows significantly more than I do on the matter of what most likely went wrong with the servers. So again, please keep that in mind. This is my first semester at the college. Much like the first thing I mentioned. Please keep that in mind before you comment. I only have so much to work on and I'm still trying to find my way around the college. I assumed that the server were campus wide but evidently I was wrong. Additionally, when teacher stated that he runs the servers, I believed him and assumed that he built in as well. I was obviously wrong, and I'm sorry. I genuinely just took him at his word given that he was a professor, and it's my first semester. Now then, me and my sister asked around and learned some things. Teacher has been in the meeting all day with the dean and wasn't able to meet with me. There are separate servers for the whole college. The ones directly affected are reserved for the students who are in the art programs that the college has to offer. This is so that we can access 
resources such as digital books and Adobe. On that note, it turns out that Teacher is the college's higher expert on Adobe. He managed the server in that regard, along with handling IT specifically for the Macs on campus. Additionally, he maintains the servers reserved for the art student, so apparently he was working with his rights for doing what he did. Their backup situated off campus according to an IT employee that my sister spoke with and they weren't affected whatsoever. According to him, the dean told the teacher to switch to a single centralized cooling system at the beginning of the semester. Therefore, they've only had the one cooling system and they've been having issues all semester without it shutting off. I didn't notice any of this because I did my schoolwork and homework at home. Danny mailed it to my professor due to my anxiety with being around large groups of people. Supposedly, everyone jumping on and access the server in lieu of final exams as of late was a linchpin for everything to fall apart. He says that the burning smell may have been the servers all shutting off, but he wouldn't tell me more than that because I was a student and it was against school policy for him to go into detail on account of security reasons. A student tried to hack the school servers a few years back, so that's why. As for the dean and teacher, most likely, the teacher will be fired because he's been causing problems for a while, and the IT employee wouldn't be surprised if this is what does he need because they need to replace some expensive parts. Dean, however, I don't know and will probably not find out because there is only one week left of classes. I did receive an email saying that those who have their assignments completed need to either email teacher or print out projects. We just built a document in InDesign, and that gives us only 10 cents to print documents as a whole. An exception would be made for those affected by the servers going down. Our syllabus repeatedly stated to always back up their work and teacher often remarked in class to back up our work. So no one's getting a free out due to the situation given that we've had the whole semester to do the assignment. Man, that just sucks. And I'll tell you what, like, it doesn't matter. If you work for someone, if you're a teacher, for example, the dean tells you to do something, you know what? Um, just tell him it's impossible. Make sure you send that stuff through email. Get some paper trail in there. And you know what? If the person in the end says, hey, do it anyway, at least you have proof that, hey, I did what I was told. I was told I was going to be fired if I didn't do it. So I did it. That's all you need to do. Keep paper trail. You want it all? Enjoy shutting down for the afternoon. I work in a children's hospital and my job is to send progress notes to insurance companies to convince them to pay for children's cancer treatments. Because apparently that's nothing you need to do. Most all transactions work the same. I fax the insurance company the notes that we call clinicals, and they fax us back something saying, Yes, this patient's approved for those days. Please fax notes again in four days. There's one local insurance company that we deal with a fair amount that is just an absolute worst. They send fax after fax with incomplete information on it, with no information, with wrong birthdays, so that we can't find the patient, etc. They've occasionally sent faxes with no other identifying information than their own file number for the patient. Like, we don't use your system, idiots. They send denials for the stupidest things, usually because they didn't receive clinical. Until I call them and say, we sent it yesterday at 2.52 p.m. I have confirmation that it went through, if you'd like the number. Oh, okay, there it is. The worst, though, is that one of the main nurses always pluralize clinicals as clinicals, ugh. Anyway, we've had a patient of theirs here for literally hundreds of days. They typically send approved or denying days every couple of days. But for this patient, we got approved days the first week or so, but nothing since then. I called in about once a week and say, Hey, did you get the clinicals I sent? Yes. Then can you fax back the approved days? They always say, it's pretty much approved, or I'll send your request to the case manager, but I never hear anything back. I think the case managers that start this quit, and the case is just in some weird bureaucratic netherworld. More likely, every other case manager doesn't want to do it because they will have to review everything. This patient discharged last week, finally, she's healthy, and so I need to know the status of those days so I can close her out of my list. I call the company and say, this patient that I've been calling about, I really need an actual facts with an actual authorization number so I can close this and not gamble a multi-million dollar account 
on someone saying, yeah, I think she's approved. The woman on the phone still barks and I say I really needed facts today. That every day of clinical has been sent over the past 9 to 10 months. She starts getting frustrated and says she'll call me back. I tell her that's been told to me before and no one has called. She says, fine, just refax the clinical for days you don't have. I've already faxed everything. Well, I don't see it and it would just be easier for you to fax them again. I've already told her how many days were missing, but I was tired of dealing with her and I had time. So I spent the next 45 minutes going through this patient's chart and putting all of the clinical for almost the past year into one document that totaled over 150 pages. I faxed it to her. My hospital is pretty nice and modern, so although we deal with fax every day, we don't have a fax machine so much as a program that collects and treats everything like a PDF. Much easier. Apparently, the smallish insurance companies still use paper faxes because about 20 minutes later, I get a call from someone else there asking me to cancel the fax I sent because it's been 30 minutes and it's only on page 20 or so. I say that I cannot cancel the fax because I've been requested to send everything. She hangs up. Another call comes from then a minute or so later, but it's my lunch time so I ignore it and go about my merry way. I get a fax from then later this afternoon that just says, all days approved, case closed. I hope I ruined their whole day, especially since they're terrible and are apparently too stupid to know how to cancel a fax from their side. Look guys, I know everybody or their parents or someone they know had problems with insurance companies. And the major problem is most insurance companies don't care. You know what? It's because they're going to have to pay. They're very happy when you have to pay your insurance, but not when they actually have to pay for your clinicals. Because, hey, it's much easier. You miss one freaking day and you need to go to the hospital, they probably make you pay. But the moment you need them, they don't care. It's not their problem, right? Anyway, boys and girls, I really hope you enjoyed this video. Leave me a comment in the end. Give me a thumbs up. Let me know what you guys think. And today's Friday, I still have videos coming up for the next few days. But if I don't see you guys, I really hope you guys have a great Mother's Day. Enjoy as much as you can. If you're a mother, have a great your day. And I'll be seeing you guys in the next video. Take care.